Welcome to the Hampton Beach Village District Monthly Meeting. It is May 10th, 2017. Can we stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, welcome everyone. We have a full crowd. Um, just we have uh, a couple of selectmen here, Selectman Griffin, Selectman Barnes, and a great crowd. Do you notice we have more people than you have at your meeting? Just so you know. <laughs> All right. So Senator Ennis was supposed to be here. I don't know if he's running late or not. I haven't heard from him. Hmm? Uh, so I think we'll start with uh, Chief Rich Sawyer. So, Chief, we asked you here, the uh, same as last year, just to go over things that you can help us with and what we can help you with. And um, maybe if you could answer some questions after you, you talk um, from some of the people in the audience of what's going on. It would Absolutely. Be great. Absolutely. Thank you. Timing's everything. Uh, we have actually had a meeting this morning up at the uh, fire department uh, regarding the fireworks and getting the permit stuff. And, you know, there's a new company coming in, uh, moving some things around. So we did have a good discussion about that. And some of the safety issues, we're going to expand the safety zone on the north side, uh, things that uh, we just noticed. We've been doing it for years, but you try to you try to learn from every year yeah. and try to make safety measurements uh, that much better for us, so we don't have any issues down there. So, so I just want to, before you even go, I want to clarify for for the for the rest of the board. I talked to RS Fireworks, who we have contract with, and the other gentleman, Warren from American, American Thunder, Thunder right. who has done our fireworks before. The two companies have merged, oh, so the same really? people are doing it together. So the two companies that we've used over the years are working together. So um, that just happened in the last less than a month. So. Representatives of both companies were there today. The, the, IRA, the folks that were doing it the last couple of years were there. RS was there and Warren was there. Had a good discussion. Uh, fire chief was there, fire prevention, myself, and the state fire marshal. We're just trying to get everybody on the same page. We know we're going to have a busy upcoming season. And again, every year we're just trying to take a step back and look what could we do better. Um, so some good discussions there on trying to make the, these shows you know, as spectacular as we can have them, but doing it safely. So uh, the permits have not come forward yet. Um, those will be forthcoming, though. I'm, I'm sure that the, the fine work that those folks do on both companies now that they're together will be, will be that good product that uh, will get things going forward. I don't anticipate any delays in that area. Um, I know one of the areas we've talked about in the past is trying to increase or, or better level of traffic flow through the main beach area because it's a constant problem we experience during those peak hours. And one of the things we talked about was a program we brought uh, into place a couple of years ago on the 4th of July, bringing in the crowd control gate. And that has always been one of the, uh, the issues of how to get more. We've, we've uh, had the, the good fortune of uh, having a relationship with the city of Lawrence because they've borrowed our fence and we've borrowed theirs, and it's been pretty good. But the consistency of being able to do that um, has been difficult, and then trying to expand it, the time periods that we use it. So uh, through the good graces of the town manager and the board of selectmen, I was able to uh, offer an idea to come up with some funding by utilizing um, funds by, per instead of purchasing three cruises from the budget as I normally do, we're only going to purchase two. When we have police details uh, in the town of Hampton or fire details, the, uh, there's a thing called the Fund 26. Now, what Fund 26 uh, accomplishes is a means to pay the police. Oops. Oh, I'm sorry. Come on in. There we go. Very informal here. <laughs> Fund 26 is how we, we pay for the police officers and the fire, firemen on the different types of details for public safety. On addition to the details, there's a 30% uh, administrative fee that goes to the town to cover retirement issues, insurance, and a little extra that keeps the fund fluid. The fund can also be used to provide vehicles for these activities, which gives us the authorization to either outfit cars or purchase cars. So we're going to purchase one of the cruises this year uh, out of that fund. 
that'll free up just under thirty thousand dollars to do some other things uh, in public safety, primarily the fence. Uh, actually executed the purchase order today. That'll be going up to the town office. Hopefully we can have that fence in before Memorial Day. And I'm exploring the possibility of deploying that fence either for the whole summer or for longer durations. Certainly we have to deal with our partners with the New Hampshire DOT uh, and Dread on the opposite side of the road. I want this to be a cooperative venture. I, I believe I have the, the authority of chief of police to just do it. But I think down here things work best when we're all doing it together for the, for the same common good cause. So we're engaging in that. Uh, Mr. Nyan from the uh, Experience Hampton Group and the uh, Hampton Beach Area Commission is helping me a little bit with that. We're also looking to decorate them, make them a little more decorative. Um, you've traveled. Uh, I've traveled in Nashville a few times, and they use that fence extensively in their downtown area, Broadway areas, it's called. And they, they dress it up a little bit. They have actually uh, these nice decorative sleeves uh, that go over the fence and, you know, welcome the Nashville message. And that's kind of what we've envisioned here, a welcome the Hampton Beach message that we're trying to do. So it would be it would be a safety issue, but it will also look nice and, and be aesthetic to the, to the neighborhood. So um, I'm hoping to get all... Hopefully we can get all that done before the 4th of July. So that's a major move forward for us in the area of traffic flow, but also pedestrian safety. Um, other issues, it's, um, you know, obviously we've been uh, dealing a lot with noise issues, uh, the entertainment venues as, as they expand in this community. Um, you know, a lot of good things are happening, but there's also going to be those times where it's going to cause a problem for somebody else. Uh, we've been meeting with folks down in the Whites Island neighborhood, and we've also had some complaints up on Boar's Head about the noise, particularly coming from Bernie's uh, Beach Bar, uh, but everybody seems to be trying to work in a positive fashion to try to resolve the issue. I was out last week with uh, the ownership of Bernie's and some of the residents and uh, their own sound engineer trying to kind of come up with some solutions to it. Um, I'm confident we're going to do that, um, but I don't think that's the end of it. I believe as the beach expands and more people look at this for being the jewel that it is, more people are going to want to come and invest, and we just have to be prepared to deal with it uh, that your good time doesn't interfere with somebody else's good time. we got to find that balance, and that's not always easy to do. But we're getting there, so this will be a good test case on where we're going to go with the entertainment stuff. As far as the police department, we are actively engaged in our training. We began training uh, really last month. It starts up our training getting forward. Includes the firearms, our use of force training. We have all our new officers are actually uh, graduated last Friday from the New Hampshire Police Academy, the part-time school, and they started the next day with our in-house training, which is probably sometimes a little more rigorous because it's really fine to Huh? Have you lost any yet? Did you wear them? Well, <laughs> here's the formula. If I hire 10, I'm going to lose 8. <laughs> uh, that's just the nature of police work today because you, you, part-time guys are great, but they all have other careers or other things going on. They're not full-time police officers, but we've, you know, we've utilized part-time officers in, in the town of Hampton long before I ever came here. And I think most people would tell you we have the finest part-time officer program in the state. We, we are the highest... Uh, biggest employer of part-time police officers in the state, and unlike a lot of communities, we actually use them side by side. There's no separation between part-time and full-time. They don't wear a separate badge. There's no auxiliary or part-time uh, thing on their on their uniform. A Hampton police officer is a Hampton police officer, and in, in our eyes, you have to be able to function. So because of that, we come as close to giving our part-time officers the same level of training as our full as we can in the time that we're allowed to have them, because we are capped at how many hours in a year they can work. Um, and it's a constant turnover in law as a whole today. I mean, we, you know, the city of Manchester, uh, Nashua, the University of New Hampshire, they all look at our officers, and when they walk in and you have, I work two summers at Hampton PD, <coughs> that's a big resume item to these folks because they know that the, the quality of the work we do. Uh, many of, I think we have over 25 officers in Manchester that started their careers here in Hampton. I know we have almost 20 in Salem. Um, I take a great pride in that, that people look at our product, but I also know the problems it causes me trying to feel the team every year. So I have 10 new officers coming in um, starting in June. If you look at our roster, almost 50% of our part-time folks have less than two summers with us. Okay, that is not the way it used to be here when I first came here. 
but that's the trend you see in law enforcement. It's uh, the recruitment and retention is is very challenging. Uh, talk to the colonel in the state police. You talk to these other chiefs in the department. They're up against the same thing, but they're offering full time employment, so it's even harder for us. Um, we have been very successful with our programs, uh, recruiting them from schools. We are willing to look at people that maybe sometimes are a little bit younger than other departments will will be accepting us simply because we're able to spend more time in the training than most departments are. We focus on that very much down here. We start our training almost the week after Seafood Fest. We start our first test is the week after. So the minute we're done with one season, we're prepping for the next, and we're in the middle of that right now. So it's an extensive process. Are we having issues with the state of New Hampshire? Um the state police, where it was talked that we were going to have less, is that something that? No, there was there was uh, some issues uh, up at the state house where obviously our legislators up there are looking. They have to manage the state budget, and they're up against the same things we are at the local level. And there was a move afoot to at one point one one of the reps had offered to thought that we should eliminate uh, the entire line item for the state police to work the Hampton Beach details. Um, very surprisingly misinformed person. Um, didn't realize that it, most of East of Ocean Boulevard is actually a state park. Um, and he was so informed, I heard about this, and I made some calls up to the Department of Safety and some of our reps, and you might want to inform him that the taxpayers of Hampton are paying to police your state park. If that was a private venue, they would have six detail officers every Friday and Saturday and Sunday working in that state park coming out of their pocket. So you might be want to be a little more understanding of the Hampton taxpayers plate paying for the protection of your state park. Um, the message got through. I, what I understand is although the budget as a whole has been troublesome, uh, the money hasn't been removed from that white item at this point. It may be adjusted. And that really hasn't been the biggest issue we're facing with the state police. The relationship is great. I think, uh, Folks in the state police would tell you they work more with the Hampton Police Department than any police department in the state, and we work well. They're, this is their home down here. The guys from Troop A are in here. They're making uh, arrests out on 95 or on 101. They book their prisoners here because we're open. We don't. There's no issues between us. It's when you look at the workforce today. The folks coming into police work, they do great work. They really do, but they have a different mindset on it. They do not work the amount of hours that people of my generation do. And that's not good or bad. That's just the way it is. And, you know, you have people get down on, well, you know, no work ethic. That's not true. They work very hard for the time they're there. But they value their personal lives and private lives. They're not going to do like I would and get up from the Christmas dinner table because somebody called and they needed you to come in. They, that's just not who they are. Um, nobody should expect them to be that. And they'll probably be much healthier people in the long run because... <laughs> Their priorities are better than ours. Um, but that does cause her an effect. It's, you know, when I'm looking for 10 troopers to come down and give us a hand, I may get four. Okay? They, they have a mission across the state of New Hampshire, and we have to understand that. That's why we instituted the program last year, bringing in the officers from the outside communities that we're willing to send them. And I, I'm looking to expand that uh, this year, depending on it's the weather has, has worked to my benefit. I know for the business people don't like me. <laughs> I'm not playing for the rain. It's just, it, I'm just, so far it's been a savings for me budget wise. But the minute we get that first warm day, I will get phone calls from some of my friends that are educators down in Merrimack Valley to let us know their kids are coming. Um, and I'm great, you know, great with that. This is a fun place. I was a kid once and had my fun here. But things are such now that we had incidents like last year where an officer surrounded trying to do his job by 300 people. And one of my officers winds up with a concussion because some, uh, something was thrown at the back of his head. That is not going to be tolerated. It is unacceptable. And we are going to take every reasonable, lawful measure this year to make sure there is no reoccurrence of that type of activity. I don't think it's anything this community wants. I don't think it's anything that the state park folks want. Um, and we have to be prepared for it. It's just that critical time right now where we start getting the warm weather to about the 4th of July, where people are feeling a little rambunctious. It's been a long winter. They come up make that bad choice of starting to imbibe and drink alcohol when they shouldn't be in a public place, and then we have to take the action we have to take. So I would caution everybody, if you have friends that uh, like to come here, 
please don't do that. I, I don't like <laughs> I don't like calling p parents up to come get their kids uh, well, out of my job. It's been going on as long as I can remember, but I think the uh, the work that you guys are doing now have definitely improved the conditions down here. So I, yeah. I gotta congratulate not only yourself but all the guys that work with you. Thank you. That's Appreciate that. And if there's anything else we can touch on, I knew you were going to ask me a question. You can't help yourself. <laughs> yes, because this is really important. You and I had a chat at the delivery session briefly about using your camera during the sand sculpture event. At the, camera the surveillance trailer. camera trailer? That's the one. Yes. Can we do that? Yes. And when can we have it? When would you like it? When do we want it? Where is he? Did he leave? Yeah. All right. June 15th is the competition, so we can have it up by the uh, if you can find me, if you, if you would just find me the week before, reach out to me, let me know, remind me of that because I just want to make sure it's charged up because that is a, is a battery operated unit, kind of like the uh, variable message boards. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure if it's going to be out there for an extended period of time, you want that, that, even though it has a solar panel, depending on the weather, it may not keep it up. So you want to have a good solid charge in those batteries. So with three weeks total, would it, uh, new leases on the outside and you just want to have it up during the major conference? No, I'll, I'll, I'll put it out there when you want it. it, it it's not that problem. It's just probably if we're going to talk a three-week period, I'll probably have to bring it in on more than one occasion just to charge it up, depending on the sun. If it's good bright three weeks, we'll probably be okay. Um, and, you know, I can look. I think there's power sources in that area. I may be able to use some dread. Uh, uh, yeah, there is. Yeah. And if dread gives me, yeah. yep, if dread, you know, they put the power in for the seafood fest, I think I can access that. If they'll let me access it, then I can leave it in place while it's charging. They have them right on the lamp post. Yep. Yeah. I just have to get permission from them to use it. I don't think they'll have any objection to it. I don't think so um, in that area, that's one issue I did want to bring up. I, if you saw the selectmen's meeting, we were fortunate enough to uh, be part of a cooperative uh, grant with the University of New Hampshire Police Department, Durham Police Department, and Laconia Police Department for what's called a Skywatch Tower. <coughs> so if you travel to places like New York City or New Orleans, uh, it's a trailer unit that's a hydraulic lift that has an observation platform for a police officer can either be in it or not, it can be unmanned, and it does have the ability to use uh, cameras um, and just we set up a crowd control situation. So I anticipate that we'll be using it on the 4th of July for that event and also for um, the Seafood Festival. Any other events that we deem appropriate, we can get access to it. It's just we're kind of all trying to set up a schedule because UNH wants it for commencement and homecoming. Uh, Laconia would like it for their um, their motorcycle weekend, and they have the pumpkin festival now. So those type of things, but we're all working cooperatively. All the chiefs involved, uh, we're all familiar with each other and the, and the issues we deal with due to crowd control situations and special events, and we all kind of back each other on those with equipment and personnel if we need to. So. So good stuff's happening. It just uh, takes a little while to get there. I'm just a Charlie. Do you want to mention anything about the exit? Of is that is that something you want to talk about? Well, I'm still working on it. I'm All right. Back to so, talk to Rich. All right. There's been talk about having on busy nights to start off exit right out of the parking lot. The back gate here to the town lot, to the municipal lot. Yeah, municipal lot onto Brown Ave. I'm just curious what you thought of that. The, the, here's the concern that you hear from the folks about people kind of sneaking in the back gate, okay? What could we do to prevent that? You know, could we do a one-way, you know, kind of ground-level thing where you drive over it one way, but it would puncture your tires going the other way? I okay. said that I got yelled at, so. <laughs> You know, I kind of like that because, you know, when people do things they shouldn't be doing, I just want, I want to see an immediate <laughs> doing that. <laughs> But in this light, it's probably not better to have my ideas on it. it I'll, I'll leave it to other folks. It's um, We post it, uh, do not enter, and if, if somebody does enter, then if we're there, there's an enforcement action we can take for failure to obey a traffic control device. Um, but it's more managing it. I just want to make sure it's not going to cause a problem for folks working in the parking lot or a safety issue. Because that is one of my areas of concern is, you know, people do. Recent history has been people get confrontational with any that's representing government, let alone the police. I just don't want to put any of our folks working in the parking lot just trying to do their job at risk dealing with somebody that might get hostile when they try to sneak in the back gate to avoid paying the $10 or whatever we're charging that night. I, I think it's more, I think it's something that for an exit mm -hmm. at night you can move the gate open to help clear out the beach after fireworks or a major concert would be a good trial. 
And we're, we're, I think I'm talking to the, uh, the rec director. I'm more than willing, you know, staffing available that at the end of those events, like Wednesday night of fireworks, you do get that traffic jam, and it usually backs up right beyond this building for a short period of time. If we were letting people out and directing them out to go out, Brown Ave out that way, that might loosen some of the beach traffic up. I think part of the problem is when we deal with the 4th of July is our Super Bowl, and when you deal with why do the things happen here that the way they happen, it's people come up here, and they only know one way to get in and out of this beach, and because it's the way their parents showed them, because they've been coming here for 40, 50 years, like all of us. Okay, we all can Yes, and everybody over 286. Okay, so <laughs> that's the problem. When you look on a, you know, I, I was living over the bridge uh, when I was deputy chief, and that was the thing. Loved living over this. Seabrook Beach is a great place, but you better have all your shopping done by 8 o'clock on Friday night, because you're not getting off that beach, <laughs> <laughs> you know, until Sunday afternoon, because it's just, you got two lanes heading south, to 286 in Salisbury has had some nice things going on down there. They're trying to upgrade their stuff. So a lot of people go in there and you have two lanes coming north and they meet in the middle to go to one lane. Okay, so anybody that's down in that intersection on a Sunday or Saturday afternoon, it's it's a nightmare. So how do we get people to get out of here and understand that, yep, I know you want to go south, but driving north a little bit might be faster for you. So we did that on the 4th of July. We did... Um, we had a plan in place that when the traffic, which it routinely does, backs all the way up down Church Street out to Ocean Boulevard, we stopped the cars from turning up to Church Street, and we sent them north. And we had uh, we borrowed a lot of um, variable message boards from uh, neighboring communities, and New Hampshire DOT was very helpful to detour them all the way up to High Street. Now, most of these people go going south, so it doesn't make sense to them. But time-wise, you're going to sit on 1A... If you're anywhere near the Ashworth, you're there for an hour at least. Because the other problem you have is the bridge going up. Maritime traffic takes precedence. We have spoken to the Coast Guard on a number of occasions and say, can't you just queue up all the boats coming in to come in in one thing? And they can't, or they won't. I don't know what it is. They do it in Newburyport. I don't know why they can't do it here. Apparently, Newburyport has much more influence than I do. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you on that. We have attempted many occasions. And, you know, Chief Silver and I, back in the day, met with them. Uh, and it's just one of those things that we have not been able to accomplish. Um, i got to be honest, I'd rather see some of the traffic going north anyhow, because we're, we, we free up the northbound traffic fairly quick. We get it moving. I shut down the road at D Street, and I shut that down for a minimum of 10 minutes after the last shell goes off. And we just stand there. We hold traffic to let the mass of humanity come across the roadway, get to their cars, because trying to run cars through that is just kind of a waste of time. Because uh, people are going to step out in front of the cars, and we could yell at all the people we want. There's too many of them. We can't arrest everybody. We can't issue everybody a ticket. So we just stop the traffic, let people get across. Once the traffic gets flowing and they catch up to where it's queued up beyond that, it takes roughly an hour for us um, to get at least moving. But last year was really good because the minute that traffic backed up and it was looking, it was backing up right out on Ocean Boulevard, it was you couldn't fit another car uh, out Church Street. We shut down that intersection and we just direct we put enough officers to give people direction, follow the detour signs, follow the detour signs, and we had people uptown monitoring and it seemed to work. We had a Good steady flow, heading out High Street, heading across Route 1 using the traffic control device, and having somebody there to manually operate that when we needed. And when we saw the cars backing up on High Street, we could manually flip the lights to go green across and get them across and get them out to 95 that way. Now, I know some folks uptown weren't pleased with that decision, and I, and I understand that. Uh, it's, it's traffic they don't usually experience. But... We're dealing with a large crowd that's in excess of 100,000 100, people, and I have to find ways to loosen up that pressure of that grid, and that's the way we have to do it. And so we didn't get many complaints, you know, when we actually did it. I think it was the perception that we're running all these these horrible beach people up through the town, and I get that. I understand. I'm, <laughs> hey, I'm a horrible beach person. That's where I'm from, and now I live uptown, so I understand it. But it's a matter of public safety. It's a matter of getting... Um, the traffic moving because what happens down here is when folks have been coming here for events and dealing with things and unfortunately they've been drinking and doing whatever they're doing down here and then they hit the traffic they get angry <laughs> and they wind up getting angry with the people next to them or in front of them cutting them off and that's when we have those instances of the fights and those things that happened years ago that were horrific 
it always happened when people have been sitting in traffic for periods of time and get frustrated and they decide to take it out on the folks that are sharing the experience with them and if we keep the traffic moving we have far fewer problems uh, of, of the order maintenance type of thing so that's what we're trying to accomplish and it's uh, I don't think it's ever going to be a final plan it's always going to be a work in progress because somebody will always come up with a better idea we keep we keep evolving it so <laughs> Questions from the audience? Yeah, yeah, the Chiefs, he's right on the money there. The guy's done a great job moving people at 101 on Oak Landing Road. And what I did want to touch, people that don't know in this room what we were talking about is the back gate of the block. When you walk out of the building, you down a handicap ramp. Directly across from that ramp is the gate we're talking about. I know Chuck's talked about the fireworks nights and the casino, and the casino nights and stuff. And I was actually looking for it to be open all the time. Because incremental release, the locals, you can get in, you can get out, it works. And if it's choked down, it won't be an issue, you know, with, with people going in. And that, that's really what I'm looking for. And I don't think the chief or the fire chief or, or, uh, or uh, public works, you know, has, has, has seen an issue with it. You know, just to, let, just to let everybody know, I think we can make this work. And, and this, this lot makes a lot more money than that lot, you know, per space. So... And then the money goes towards the rec fund, 20% of it goes towards the rec fund, so it's, it's a good thing. <coughs> so, thank you very much. <laughs> I'd like to just address that just for a minute. Um, Chief Sawyer probably knows, living on the Seabrook side, coming over on Saturday morning, the backup is actually going into the state park. Yes. Mm -hmm. Same thing on Brown Ave, as they're coming down Brown Ave, they can't get around because they're trying to get into that parking lot. So to add another congestion right there, I, I can see the exit, but going in, no, that's why we have those. No, no, exit. There are stations. So no, no, nobody's talking about it as an entrance. Yeah. Strictly oh, an exit. Yeah, yeah. okay. Just, okay, as an exit. I also think when, at any point in time, the police have done a great job. I think the only people that should be able to close those gates, whether it's the one on Ashworth or the one on Brown, is the chief or his shift designate. If he has a situation going on at the bridge, an accident, crowd control, whether it's on 101 on the bridge of the boulevard, he should be able to call down here and say, hey, close that gate or open that gate, send them out this way or that way. He should be ultimately having control. They do a great job. The issue you spoke about, John, just so you know, I did try to address that um, with Dredd uh, coming over the bridge yeah. at the state park. Here's what happened. As we try to become more modern and use technology, sometimes there's an unintended consequence, and that's what that is, because I, I went down there one day, I was taking a drive, you know, I take it, so you don't know, I usually take a drive every, every Saturday and every Sunday, almost every weekend of the year, just to see what's going on, and, you know, you see, you know, people see me, sometimes I, I take a car, nobody knows, so I drive around, see what's going on, and uh, I found that when I'm going the heck is this because it was backing up over the bridge and that's what it was and that really hadn't been like that what changed was that it was either the last year or the year before they went to a new ticketing system the old days is the is the car started queuing up a couple of the folks working the booth would take a roll of tickets apron and they'd walk up the line to save time so they didn't have to pull up to the gate because that's what it is if you have to pull up to the gate it's time consuming because each individual customer and now that it's an electronic system Okay, it takes even a little bit more longer. It's kind of like the equation of, you know, the new chipped credit cards. Yeah. While it's a lot more secure, it takes a lot longer than swiping. Okay, and that's what this is. The technology is great. It make, makes it more efficient for the state to operate their parking lot, but it's also causing just that momentary delay with each car, and it has a cumulative effect. There's not a much we can do. They even offered to, to pay to have a police officer there, but i got to be honest, there's no effect the police officer is going to have on it because once it's backed up to the bridge, it's one lane. There's nothing we can do. But once you get past there, you fly right down to the... The only gate. possible change I could, I could offer to them is maybe consider, but it's going to take up parking space, is to widen those lanes so that coming in, we can have a double lane coming in so we can queue them up double and put a kiosk on either side. That's the only possible suggestion I can make on that. Mm -hmm. Other than that, I, I think we have to you know, come to a reality here. We've made a decision as a community and as a state that we're going to make this a great place to visit. And we have. Everybody's coming here. I I've, I've grew up here. You, don't, you didn't see crowds like you see now on that beach on a Saturday and Sunday. 
You don't see the folks burying our parking lots and coming across with all the coolers full of stuff back when I was a kid down here. It, that, it was busy, but it wasn't that busy. And the problem is, it's a small area, and there's only so much we can do to dress it up and make it better. I know technology helps, um, and I think maybe if we could talk to the folks in Dread, and I don't think they're opposed to it, it would just cost money to do that and come up with a, you know, a, a true traffic plan where we could double up the cars. And think about it. When, when have you seen it happen? I see it on Sundays. I usually, I'm like, I don't, and I'm like, Chuck, I don't leave the beach on a Saturday or Sunday. I had to go to Home Depot for one of those parts that I couldn't, you know, something happened. <laughs> and we missed clues. And Chuck was around. Oh, yeah. And I'm coming back, and it's all backed up, all backed up, and I'm swearing at myself. Yeah. And then as soon as I get over, bam, right to my house. Yeah. You know? But it was all the backup of those people yeah. trying to go in there. They're aware of it. Yeah. I just don't know how much they actually can They've do it. talked to them about it yeah. as well. So. And I think we're going to have to accept something. If, if yeah. we're going to continue to operate Hampton Beach as this great place to come to, then people are going to show up, and we're going to have to deal with what the crowds do. Yeah. The trash, sometimes the not nice behavior in some of the traffic. It, it's just one of those things that we're going to do what we can do, but there's only so much you can do. <laughs> you know, we have to accept that. And it's not always easy for people to understand that, but I think most of the people we're talking about in this room, we've all been around a lot of years so I don't I think we are more tolerant of it than some of the new folks that buy properties in town and they don't understand why it is the way it is are the issues you face today significantly different than they were say five years ago I would say five years ago is kind of where I saw the change where I kind of interpret the change is coming I, I did a, a, a staffing issue because you know prior to me becoming chief I was the deputy chief and one of the biggest jobs you do is that staffing issue because we're not like other police departments. We change gears like nobody else around us. People are in awe of how we do our operation because we go from a town the same size as Exeter to the biggest city in the state of New Hampshire, and it's because the sun came out. Okay, so we have to we have to be really quick to change. Now, what we have noticed is our big big time periods where we had the most activity would be Wednesday nights a big night because of the fireworks, but then it ends quick. Saturday, uh, Friday night into Saturday, and then Saturday night. One of the biggest areas that jumped up on us was that Sunday period. The 24 hours of Sunday uh, moved past Friday. We're busier on Sunday, the 24 hours of Sunday, than we are the 24 hours of Friday. Because you get that after effect of the Saturday night crowd carries into it. But Sunday now, you used to be able to come down here on Sundays by 6, 7 o'clock. The crowd had cleared out and it was quiet. That doesn't happen anymore. We have traffic people out there till seven, eight o'clock, just doing traffic, and our volume of calls um, due to the folks just not necessarily super bad, but just that number of people uh, has gone through the roof in the last five years because the dining and entertainment venues have been improved to that level that people are coming here and staying later on a Sunday as opposed to going home. So I, I think those are the type of things we try to monitor. Um, you know, we kind of joke about the guys that, you know, when I first came onto this department, Friday and Saturday nights, we were going from house party to house party, cottage party to cottage, and it was like 5 a.m. before we were done, and we would still have the booking room full of people at 5 a.m. that were just battling with us. Now it's different. I mean, we get our fair share of people, and I think I've highlighted the over-serving of alcohol in our establishments. They're less combative in that regard. We don't get the big house parties like we used to. Um, we're dealing with the bar closing times. When they when the bars close and we have these bigger venues with the entertainment, they come out like a herd. And the problem is is you get neighbors and abutters because a lot of our, our our businesses abut residential. And therein lies a lot of the conflict we're seeing in the papers today and trying to manage that. So as the crowd come out, we try to be there to get them to move along and please you know, you gotta move along, you gotta be quiet. People are trying to sweep. And trying to do that with people that may have had too much to drink is, is kind of tough. And sometimes it doesn't go nicely. We have to make arrests. We try to keep the arrest minimal. We're not trying to lock up as many people as we can. That's not the way I want this department operated. I want to try to minimize the police in that area. I want to try to get people to comply willingly. But that also counts on the businesses to comply willingly. So last year we, had, we did have a, a couple of meetings with the business owners to let them know. You're over-serving people. 
We understand it's a short season, but the liability is on you, and our officers are trained. When you find somebody walking around or somebody driving a car that's intoxicated, one of your primary task is to identify where they were. And then we go back, and we interview, and we refer to the New Hampshire uh, Liquor Enforcement Bureau that can bring sanctions against them, like suspensions of licenses or sanctions against the, the people that are serving. Um, it's just one of those things. We're trying, you know, we want you to come here and have fun. But you've got to balance that against safety. And, and that's what we're, we're really dealing with is you don't have traffic backed up over the bridge till 2 a.m. like when I was a kid. But you have a lot of people walking. You know, when we have shows, I, I, I was out the other night, there was a show, and I just, I just sit there and I watch where are these people going. I think there was as many people staying on Hampton Beach going to places as people that drove. Okay? which is good for the revenue, it's good for the folks in business, but they're walking in the roadways. <laughs> so we're trying to, you know, so it's a different approach we're taking and it's a different kind of, it's a lot of it deals with people that have, you know, having a good time and maybe a little too good of a time and we're still managing that. It's just kind of a different crowd that we're doing it with. But I, you know, I, I thank the businesses. They're doing a better job, I think, managing their businesses. It's just one of those things I'm constantly gonna be harping on is watching the over-serving of the alcohol because it is the root of much of the, the evil that goes on in this community when it happens. Usually when you trace it back, the root cause has been alcohol. So. Any other questions from the audience? You got Steve over here? Oh, yeah, Steve and I didn't <laughs> um, Was it last year, the first year that you put a, that was parking, uh, the, some parking issues that you resolved with the town of Hampton and you were gonna hire some part-time um, Parking enforcement people? Yes. Did you end up doing that? We did that last year, and we had started that the year before. Uh, it, was, it was very effective. Uh, I, I had intended to hire three the first year. I only wound up hiring one. Um, but that one gentleman is just uh, he's a great guy. Um, but he's taken on a new job with me, so I, he's off of the parking. I think he, pu he pushed our parking revenues up by over $40,000 in one year. <laughs> That's good. He's a former postmaster. He's a very organized man, and, and you know he's on a mission. And uh, he's a great guy, Jimmy Mills. Um, and he started with the police department as a volunteer, just coming in, trying to do some good, helping us with files. And again, very organized guy, and, and helping us get our files up to date. And you know, trying to do scanning, you're trying to store things we're trying. So he started that. He was a natural guy. Hey, would you like to run parking enforcement? We're bringing that back, and you'd be a great guy. You know, it's got some. He wasn't interested. It's not the money with this guy. He's just a guy that wants to help his community. So we started with that. Did a great job. We brought on another uh, retired gentleman, and it's been working great. But now Jim has taken on a, a job with me as a, uh, a part-time evidence technician, trying to loosen up some of the detectives' load, going back and forth to the lab to Concord and cataloging the evidence because we do do take in a lot of evidence to the volume of cases. So now I'm. Um, I still have the other retired gentleman, and I'm looking to fill with a couple other folks just to do the parking ticket stuff. The officers will still do it, mm -hmm. but when we have these guys out there dealing with, particularly the parking lot areas and the side streets where you know they may not get to because they're busy with other things, I'm trying to free up police officers to do. Don't you know? Not I know some people get upset when I say this. Parking is an issue, but it's not a top priority of the Hampton Police Department right now because. We have many more things to be dealing with in this community as far as things that can can cause serious harm to the community, and that's what I want my officers focused on. Parking tickets are what we do when we don't have anything else going on, and that's a rare time in this community that we don't have something going on where it's, it's absorbing and using up manpower. So when I have these folks working, that really loosens up the officers to do the real police work. So that's what we're trying to accomplish. Okay, so, um, so it's been going pretty good. So the people that, uh, that are not only in this room but at home watching, this this show they can uh, you can that's a free ad for it. yeah and I'll offer this too because this is I, I tell everybody what's the number one issue that people get upset with the police department about I go you know it, it's not uh, it's not my officers they don't get you know we don't I don't get many complaints about the conduct of my officers because these new guys they're they're just and ladies they're, they're just incredibly polite people they're just I don't know, you know, where they're coming from everywhere, but the, whoever's been raising them has been doing an outstanding job because they are the politest group of police officers I have ever seen in my career, and I've been around 30 years. Um, the biggest issue you get is parking tickets. I will get people, I want to speak to the chief now, and I get them on the phone, and people gather around my office just to list somebody, and they go off about a $30 parking ticket. 
and I'm trying to tell them just file an appeal, and they won't. And they they they're more interested in tearing into me a little, because I'm I will I take every phone call, I listen to everybody's complaint, and I try to let them speak. I don't interrupt them, and they just go off about parking tickets, and I just tell them, yeah, just file the appeal, and I'll grant it. That that sounds reasonable. It's I don't want the police department to be looking looked at as a revenue generating agent. That's a, that's a thing that happens because we're doing our job as enforcement. But I, I just don't think it's a good policy for, for a community or anybody else to be looking at law enforcement as a way to raise revenue, okay? Because that's going to skew judgment, okay? Am I, am I really <coughs> writing you a ticket or looking at you as somebody because you're doing something wrong because of that? Or because we can get some revenue out of it? So I don't look at the police department, and I, and I will never advocate for the police department to be solely as a revenue generating. People shouldn't look at us that way because it, I'm not doing it. It's just it's wrong in my in my eyes. It's morally and ethically wrong that, to do that. Yeah. We write the tickets because it's a violation. It's not. I'm not in the business of punishing people. That's that's up to a judge. The only reason, <laughs> the only reason, the only reason I brought it up is that um, I don't have a problem with people yeah. parking in, my, in front of my house because they park yeah. the parking lot there, but. There are some people in this room that have some issues with people parking, you know, illegally parking. And I know that there were enough issues that the John, you know, the selectman, you worked with the selectman, yeah. came up with a plan. I think the biggest issue, you know, you look at the uh, the infrastructure project we did down here at the beach, where we now have sidewalks and curbs, and it's very clearly where you can park. Now, when I first came here, that, it was a tough call. You'd, you'd come down and somebody's complaining about a car park, and it's... I don't know if that's the driveway, I don't know if that's the public lot. So when we did the infrastructure, that really cleared it up. But we still have a lot of areas where it's a problem. And, we're, and we're, you know, we're trying to work on it the best we can. Proper posting and signage is always an issue. And, and here's the thing. If we enforced every parking regulation in this town to the T, there wouldn't be a business in operation on Hampton Beach. We have to try to work with the business people because they're going to have deliveries come in. And it's going to be, you know, right now, you drive down Ocean Boulevard, it's no parking. People have to get their businesses open. People have to have certain, you know, the refrigeration company come in and all this. And so I tell the officers, be reasonable with these people. If they're actually doing something, you're not wrong by allowing them to do it because the goal here is to keep people from parking there all day long and getting in the way of public safety if there was an emergency. That's truly the big issue up on the front. It's loading zone areas. So we try to be reasonable in our enforcement. Now, the, the, here's what I want to throw out there. If you get a parking ticket, please don't lose your mind over it. I go, the tie goes to the citizen in my book. As long as you're reasonable and you take the pledge that I'll never do it again, I'll take the ticket back. I'm not interested in getting you 30 bucks. It's not It's not going in my pocket, and it's really, in my, in my thing, it's not that big a deal. It's just be reasonable and understand why the officer's doing it. Because we did have one of the parking enforcement guys was assaulted last year by somebody. And it's just, it's, it's just, why would you assault somebody just doing his job and it wasn't even your car? And it, it just got out of hand and gentleman got some jail time out of it. And much deserved. But those are the things is, I understand you get upset and you think the government wronged you, but just give me a call. I answer the calls. I take the parking complaints. I know people think I'm crazy as the chief of police that I do that, but most of the time people go away pretty satisfied. So, thank you. Thank you I know much. I know the senator's going to get up there. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, thank you. Thanks, thanks very much, I got, chief. I got here first. Yeah. <laughs> 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 thanks, chief. Thank you. Thanks for everything. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, Senator Dan Ennis, welcome to Hampton Beach. Thank you. I'm, I'm supposed to be in Newcastle at 6:30, and oh, it, it ain't happening. Well, that clock's 10 minutes fast. Oh, it's, like, it's really like a bar clock. It's like the bars, huh? <laughs> That's what it is. Well, you know you've not spent enough time in a community when your name's misspelled on the agenda. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, it's I-N-N-I-S, and it's a pleasure to be here. I'm sorry I was late. Um, as some of you know, uh, I have a, a job at UNH as well as a professor, and it's that those last two weeks of the term where we're doing the graduation things and all the ceremonies, and we had an honor society induction, and um, was a little late getting out of there, but um, traffic was fine. Yeah. I've, in spite of the things I, I heard here, so um, I'm looking. We won't have you for the July meeting. <laughs> I, I, I'm looking forward to spending more time here in the summer, and this is a community that I need to get to know better, um, no doubt about it. And I know Senator Stiles did a lot of great work to help the community, and um, I, I really want to do the same over time. And I know one of the big issues is Route One. 
Um, but um, that's something that, that we can get to. But I, I was allowed 15 minutes, so I'll, I'll take that, I, I suspect. Um, for those of you who don't know me, a little bit about myself. I've been in the hospitality business, um, had a small 10-room place in Portsmouth, the Ale House Inn, then a 32-room place in Portsmouth called the Hotel Portsmouth. Uh, eventually sold those, and in Newcastle, we're opening on uh, the 1st of June, the Great Island Inn, which will be a six-room, all-suite sort of, of, of inn, an extended stay place. So I understand the business, I understand how our communities are driven by it, and how important it is to our economy, and also how difficult it can be to manage these folks when they come to visit. Um, Portsmouth has problems, uh, and having had a couple of hotels there, I understand, and, and here I think those problems are magnified because it's a, it's a denser collection of people than you have in the, in the city of Portsmouth. Um, but I work at UNH as a, as a professor. I used to be dean of business there. So I have a thorough understanding of the academic side of business, but I also understand the practical side because I've, I've done it and I, I get my hands dirty and, and get involved in it. And when, as dean, had the Small Business Development Center within the business college, also had the Center for Family Business. So working with small businesses and family-owned businesses was a key part of our outreach as, as a business college, and it continues to be. In Concord, there are a lot of interesting things happen, and it was nice to hear the chief not complain about what's happening in Concord. Um, part of what he was talking about in terms of, of a, a budgetary issue was on the House side, and some of you may know that the House hasn't passed a budget. Um, they had their deadline, they didn't make it, so the Senate is waiting for the House budget, it never came. So we're working with the governor's budget, what the House had sort of created, and our own thoughts, and we're putting together a budget that we believe will hit the deadline and we hope will be passed. Um, we'll try to work with the House leadership and the House members to try to get that done. Um, it's certainly an interesting time in the House in Concord. On the Senate side, uh, we're doing pretty well. Uh, the Senate's in session tomorrow. It looks like a, a pretty good session. My committee, I'm chair of the Commerce Committee, is taking up the lion's share of the agenda tomorrow. I think we're about half the bills that are coming forward. And what I find interesting as a first-term senator is actually how well we all get along, the Democrats and the Republicans. And when you turn on the television set, you watch the news, you hear how awful it is. We hate one another, we're yelling at one another, we disagree on everything. 85% of the bills, come out with bipartisan support. And I think that says an awful lot about how we work together and how we work to represent our constituents. And I went to Concord with that spirit in mind, and that's, that's what I've tried to do. There are 15% of the bills where we don't agree, and those can be a lot of fun. Um, but we always end up with a good resolution, and when we leave the Senate chambers, I think we all leave as friends. And that, to me, is something unique about politics in New Hampshire. And it's something I hope we'll never lose. And um, I'm really proud of that. So on my side, um, you know, the, the issues that I'm thinking about and working toward, uh, drinking water is an issue. You, you've no doubt heard about that. Some here in Hampton, it's more of an issue in the Hampton Falls, Greenland, Rye area. Uh, but the Coakley landfill has been a major issue, and I've sponsored or co-sponsored a number of bills to try to address that issue and get the DES to be a little more aggressive than the EPA is in terms of standards and testing and making sure people have safe water. PFCs are, are what are called emerging contaminants and they're all around us and we're going to find that they're in more places than we think. What we don't know is their long-term impact and um, that's something that's being studied. The EPA has set a limit of 70 parts per trillion. Most city water has PFCs in it already. Uh, the water in uh, rye in that area has eight parts per trillion. So it already exists there, and it's all around us. It's in the Teflon pan in your kitchen. Um, it used to be in Scotch Guard. It used to be in car washes. So it's, it's, it's all over the place. So we're trying to create some legislation that will get the DES to really pay close attention to this and stay on top of the current studies and make sure that the 70 parts per trillion standard is the right one. Maybe it should be lower. Some states are going lower. I'm a very pro-business senator. 
Um, I voted, of course, in favor of reducing the business profits tax. I believe in reducing regulations wherever possible. So far, my committee's gotten rid of just one, but I'm really proud of this one, and it's indicative of some of the things that, that happened in, in Concord. Um, we had a, a bill come before us. It, it, was, it originated in the House and came over to the Senate side, came to the Commerce Committee. And some of you who own businesses may know this, but most people probably don't know. The state of New Hampshire requires that you pay your employees weekly. You have to pay them every week. Now, I find that ironic because as a state senator, I get paid once uh, at the beginning of the session rather than $1.93 every week. So uh, if, if you, it, but if you fill out a form, single page form, you can get an exemption and you can pay every other week or once a month or, you know, you pick it, 15th and 30th, uh, you, you can get an exemption from the law. So the proposal was to remove that. And we had a lot of folks there who didn't want that removed. And here's what happens though. When you fill out that form, Hold up a piece of paper. Um, for an exemption, it triggers a mini investigation of your company. They show up, make sure you're following all the workers' comp rules, make sure you're paying all your taxes. They make sure that you have enough money to pay every other week. And they check your cash flow and do all these things. If you don't make that application, they don't show up. So you're inviting an examination when you fill out the form. And I asked the question, over the years you've been in office, um, how many of these have you turned down? And the answer was zero. So the uh, Commerce Committee in the Senate agreed with the Commerce Committee in the House, and we have eliminated that. I'm pretty sure the governor will sign it, and companies can now pay uh, on whatever schedule they want, provided it is at least monthly. And we took away that regulation. Um, I think that makes sense. It reduces costs for businesses. If you pay every other week, you're paying less in terms of payroll processing costs, and, and it works. So um, this, this will take away a little bit of regulation. Uh, I, I sponsor a bill regarding franchise employees. There are a lot of franchises in our state employing thousands, tens of thousands of people. And essentially, this bill said that the, the employees at a franchise that are hired by the franchisee, so the local Dunkin' Donuts, are that local Dunkin' Donuts employee. They're not employed by the national group. And there are some things happening at the national level that would, could potentially have implications for our local business people, and we wanted to remove that possibility. I'm environmentally pragmatic. Uh, I believe in protecting the environment, but I think we have to be sensible about how we do it. We live in a pretty vulnerable area, uh, and I know that. I live in Newcastle, and the flood insurance that I had to buy blew my mind. Um, I, I actually, my poor insurance guy, I, I kind of yelled at him. I said, the house is 350 years old. How many times has it flooded? And he said, our records show it's never flooded. Well, why do I need this? The government says you do. So um, small business job funds, been very supportive of that. Funds to help small businesses to create jobs and train employees. Tax credits for R&D and other business investment. And I will continue to work on those things. But ultimately... I'm employed by you, um, I serve you, and I'm interested in questions or comments or things that maybe I need to know um, as I go back to Concord tomorrow and over the coming year and a half. So, well, I always like to start, so. Uh, All right. <laughs> um, we have worked on some issues about the rooms and meals tax. Yes. And I understand, so I, I think I, I heard some great ideas um, I can't remember what meeting it was at. Instead of going for a percentage of the rooms and meals tax, maybe we could go for a percentage of the parking meters to come help the town with the, with our expenses. The state parking meters? Yeah. So that might be something for you to look at. Um, it's possible. I, you know, the rooms and meals is interesting. And it, when you think about it, logic says that communities like Hampton and Newcastle with the Wentworth Hotel, I mean, it's a small town, getting... You know, more of that, that tax for, for Newcastle would be huge. Um, Newcastle's looking at the need for a new water main, and that's going to come through increased fees. The problem is, I think you can get it through the Senate, because there are 24 senators. Many of them have tourism destinations within their districts. The problem is on the House side. 
You have 400 House members. Most of those House members are in districts that are receiving the benefits of the Rooms and Meals tax, and they're not going to give it up. So I don't see us making much progress there. I know Senator Stiles tried, but it, it never really got any legs. Senator Martha Fuller Clark wanted to allow a dollar per night per room on hotels as a tax, um, and it was taxing the rooms initially, whether they were occupied or not, uh, which, which which is a little onerous um, in February you know, for, for you know, a place like Ashworth. Um, but um, that was turned back, and I, I didn't like that idea. You know, it's a new tax. It, it, it just doesn't fit. So that idea has some potential for a town like Hampton. It won't help Portsmouth. It's not going to help, you know, some of the, the areas in the mountains. Um, so I don't, I don't know. But it might be we could get some sort of enabling legislation that would just say, if this exists, here's how it could work. We just got a check. Do you have the check from the state? Usually it's uh, for the full year, it's $798. Mm -hmm. is what we get back from rooms and meals. I personally that's send all that in quarterly. That's it? That's all yeah. the village district gets. And that's I don't think we, we and I don't remember getting it last year, so I don't even know what happened to it. <laughs> and we would get that as you well know in two payments. So it was like, you know, four hundred or three hundred and ninety eight dollars. I yeah. I would as a treasurer and, and and commissioner, I would just want to rip it up and throw it back. Yeah, I've been the I've been the treasurer now for what five or six years. Yeah. I have never. No, we haven't seen it, but you check. just got a check the other day. That was for an overpayment for a oh, fee. So that wasn't it. So we don't get any. So the village district gets nothing. So we get nothing. So we get nothing. Not the village district. We don't get nothing. We haven't all the time I've been treasurer. We have not gotten a. So we got to get it out of Hampton. Yeah. Yeah. They don't give much to Hampton. from Dread knocking on her door mm -hmm. that they want to take they're suggesting that they take 20 feet of her front yard and put a swale in there so the water drains into the marsh it's probably a good idea but they could have done it before because that really doesn't cost very much mm -hmm. but for them to take this money out of our transportation study or to not continue it especially where the selectmen and many people have come to all of the meetings that we had and Bill Watson and all the other people do a wonderful job and I'm not complaining about any of these people at work for DRED or DOT, but this is a crime. Yeah. And somebody could easily be killed there. And I can tell you many other stories about how other people are affected. About the woman that just paid $400,000 for a house which she's going to tear down. She came to all these meetings. 
she saw that the state said they were going to pony up and do this, mm -hmm. and now she's bought the house. She owns two houses in this area. It's only a two-block area mm -hmm. that they have decided not Except to continue. Not and this is something that needs to be done. Would you reach out to me? Well, we, I made a motion at this week's select meeting to send you a letter, so they are going to be sending a letter. All right. And Good. I just wanted to point that out. Thank I you. I know you're in a hurry. No, I'm okay. I'll take the time. It's a good video. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. Others, yes. Do you see sea level rise as a serious issue for the coast? I don't know. Uh, if it rises, yes. Um, I mean, I, and I say well, that... The, the state my, commission seems to say it's going to. My basement is eight feet above sea level, and, it, and it's on the water. So, you know, I bought that house a year a couple years ago I guess now um, knowing the risk of sea level rise um, there how fast is it rising when will it rise etc remains fairly uncertain there's a wide range of possibilities I think we have to be prepared for it I think we have to invest pragmatically for it what we know is it's not going to rise five feet in the next five years. That we're, we're assured of. Uh, will it rise five feet in the next 100? Might. And I think we need to keep an eye on that. We need to monitor what's happening here, continue to stay in touch um, with those who have the knowledge and the data and, and make those judgments. So, you know, I don't know. I don't know. The projections are there. Um, you know, they kind of go like this in terms of what-if scenarios. And the lower end of the projections, we're all okay for a couple hundred years or more. The upper end, my kids will have to think about it. So we, we need to prepare, but sensibly. Yeah. Others? Any other questions? Yes, sir. No, I just wanted to touch again on the tides. You know, I bought a house 40 years ago. When I bought it, it was in the swamp. Ten years later, it was in the marsh. Now it's in the estuary. Yeah. The only thing that's going up is my taxes and the tides. Well, now you have yeah, a, both now are you have guaranteed, aren't they? It. They'll keep going up. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's happening. Uh, yeah. You know, a lot more often. And, um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. What, I, I don't know what to do. Whether you know, we should be allowed to raise the elevations of our properties. Well, I think that that will forward. probably come if if it does continue. Or accelerates, um, but I, I don't. I don't know right now. At this point, uh, I'm on the Energy and Natural Resources uh, Committee as well. We didn't have any legislation that dealt specifically with sea level rise this session, and we're through all of our bills. Uh, maybe next session or next year we'll take a look at that. I, I don't know, but Bob's done a lot of work, Commissioner Ladd, on the FEMA. Yeah. Stuff, flood maps, yeah, I've seen them, and, and yeah, I, uh, believe me, I looked at them carefully when we got that flood insurance bill. Yeah. It's insane. Um, again, if the house had flooded once in 350 years, I'd maybe buy the argument, but Thank you. it hasn't. I just want to point out that that water you saw, that's fresh water from the rain. That's not yeah. from the ocean. The ocean's across the street. Got it. it doesn't cause any problems. Yeah, the ocean. Not yet. Yes. Okay. Was there, there any others? Um, and I won't buy your house till the day, and I thought for sure I was going to end up in the marsh <laughs> because of the puddle that was open from the house. <laughs> Is there anything new about dredging the harbor? Because I, don't... I looked at it the other day, and I can only see maybe two wings. I think that's a federal issue, not a state issue. So that's one that you would handle with Carol Shea Porter or one of the state's the senators. Working on that right yeah, yeah, with them, but with the feds. That. Yeah, it's it's out of the state's purview. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Welch is working. Brian, do you have something? I just wanted to say, Senator, uh, that um, one of the things that we were very used to and would like to continue is accessibility of our senator. And I hope that that will be absolutely. Um, I have I'll a take one of those. Of oh, lovely, <laughs> wonderful! Thank you so um, much. And, Perfect. And I'm always happy to hear from you. 
I, I want to know what's going on, uh, and I'll, I'll get down here some this summer. I have a 16-year-old daughter, 17 next month, and she's got this boyfriend. Um, but I'm sure we'll be at the beach, and, uh, and it'll be fine. Give us photos. We'll keep an eye on her. Yeah. <laughs> or on him. And I've got, and I've got an, a son who just got engaged, and that one... You're on camera. You're going to be careful. It's all good. Oh, he would know. If he saw it, he'd say, yep, yeah, I know. That's what Dad thinks. All right. But, well, thank I, you very much. Thank you. I, I really appreciate it. I'm sorry I was late. I'm sorry I missed my slot. Now i got to go apologize in Newcastle. <laughs> and uh, thank you again. And Thanks do contact much. me. L let me know what's happening. And if there's something I can help with, that's what I'm here for. Thanks. Thanks. I mean it. I work for you. And uh, that dollar ninety three a week is enough to keep me motivated. Thank you. Thank you. Bob, you want one? Yeah. Chuck? You want one for? Give one to Joe as well. Don't you want a cat? All right. All cats here. Greg, you're on. Greg Grady. Moving right along. Oh, right? Oh yes. Go ahead, please. Evening, Commissioners. Uh, thanks for having me once again. Craig Grady with Professional Sculptures. I'm also a local resident on Kings Highway here in Hampton. Um, I'm here to uh, shed a little light on the 17th Annual Master Sand Sculpting Classic. Uh, it's pretty much in full swing. Uh, this year's theme is going to be Hampton Beach. We make dreams come true. We're going to do a uh, big sandcastle billowing in clouds with uh, maybe some sheep and unicorns and children playing at the beach and whatever else these sculptors can think about that uh, we actually do down there. Uh, if we have any suggestions, they're welcome. Um, there's 10 world-class sculptors coming back. Uh, we have one new sculptor, Joris, or Joris Kivitz from the Netherlands. Uh, he's uh, a world-class sculptor. He's uh, just come off a win in Taiwan, uh, won just before that, he won uh, out of 15, world class out of in Texas, so I'm really excite, excited to have him here. Uh, it just ups the competition for everybody else. Um, we have one other person returning, uh, Mar uh, Mark LaPierre, who has been here um, a while ago, but hasn't competed in, in about five years. Um, he's coming back uh, to see his father off. Uh, Michelle LaPierre, who has competed here for the 17 years, and this is going to be his last competition. He's going to be retiring. So uh, maybe we can stop by and cheer him on while he's down there, but uh, um, it, it's, 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 it's nice for the uh, whole makeup of the uh, sculpture event. Your whole family coming down, Greg? Of course. Um, so, you know, they, anyway, it's a large family, but um, Michelle, the LaPierre's are a... Uh, uh, the driving force behind the ice hotel in Quebec City and all the ice sculptures that you see in the uh, ice festival up there, which is the second largest festival in the world. So uh, anyway, there it's, it's really an honor to have these folks here who want to come back and be a part of this event. Um, the dates for the uh, event, June 9th, will be dropped in the sand. The actual competition is the 15th through the 17th. We're going to have viewing through June 28th. Um, it's a rain or shine event. People can come down in the rain. Actually, uh, we get a lot of people come down uh, in the clement weather to uh, view it. Um, and it's one of the better times. There's no uh, traffic, and uh, you can get in and out real quick and, and uh, get a bite to eat without too much trouble. Um, we're doing very well with sponsors this year. Uh, I just heard uh, from a couple other people that uh, I don't know if we could I'll hold off a little bit on that, but, you know, but um, yeah, we I was just think we'll days. talk about that, or, or I can make a slide, but if anything, anyone is interested, uh, see me, we could always do something uh, moving forward. They can uh, contact me by going to HamptonBeach.org, go to the events page, uh, and uh, my information is on there for sponsorship. Um, also, if they'd like to volunteer, they can do the same thing. And uh, I don't, we don't have the, uh, they can fill out a form for the volunteer um, um, uh, and, and somebody will get back to them, just leave their phone number, or they can call Dave at 781-249-8727. 
Um, he's away, uh, um, he's not in Hampton or in the area until the 15th, but he said he will be receiving phone calls and he can give them a call afterwards. Um, <clears throat> I do have a, a security contract that I'd like for you folks to uh, review. Um, we were, uh, we had talked about doing uniform security this year. Um, and uh, it was interesting, I just talked to Chief Sawyer. Um, we had a lot of different bids and um, um, I had asked him, there's a little conflict of interest so we really couldn't suggest anybody. But he, he said he didn't uh, uh, know of any um, uh, uniform security companies in the area. Um, and, and I had a really difficult t time trying to find some legit ones. One I was being sourced out of India and I didn't realize it. Um, but the, it, it was it was unbelievable. But I, I think we finally did find a, a, a decent company that was sort of local out of Plastow, um, and we have a uh, another one um, which would be um, a, a second option right now would be Securitas, and they're out of Manchester. But their fee is almost is equal to what the uh, police department was going to be charging. So we may want to think. Uh, think about that in the future if it does become an issue. Uh, other events we do ha have police details. <clears throat> so um, that's about it. The other thing that we haven't really discussed would be next year's dates. Uh, we should start, be, you know, uh, the sponsors that are coming in this year are already asking me, um, and that would be something if we do change the brochure we might want to uh, um, think about putting in there. Um, and uh, I am going to be putting out uh, some security cameras uh, of my own that are going to re be recording everything down there. So uh, if we do have something happen, maybe we'll have something uh, um, to, to fall back on. I really don't think we're going to have any problems this year. Last year was just a fluke. Uh, we've had 15 years of uh, really uh, 17 years of successful sand sculptures down there. And, and once in a while we have had a problem. It was just one one sick person down there that uh, uh, ruined it for everybody. But um, that's about it. Take any questions if you have any. You will contact the chief, though, to get Absolutely. that Absolutely. I have that down here, right? Good. Great. You yes. said the viewing goes until the 28th? 28th, the last. So, right. when are you removing it? The 29th. The 29th. Right. But put down the 28th. 28th, because they'll show up. The 29th, yes. yeah. Screaming. Okay. We've been through that. <laughs> That's it then, right? So we got we're all set. Any other yeah, questions? Good. Yeah, I think it's great. Right, we're, we look forward to it. You do a great job. Teach. You do a great job. We love it. What about the who's not ready to go before the selectmen on the 22nd? Oh, a quick thing, Greg. That you you're supposed to go in front of the selectmen on the 22nd, but you're not going to be here, or I'm not going to be here. Okay. okay we'll so you need one of us to go? Oh, we can do that. I was um, going to ask if we could put her on the consent agenda at my work. It's good PR to get up there. Regina, there. Rick, what do you think if we... I don't think it's any problem. To go on a consent agenda? All right. So you, you keep in touch with those two? All right. All right. Excellent. All right. Great. Excellent. All right, it's that time of year again, and uh, Linda and John are out there working hard on all the flowers. They look great, so you have some some stuff to tell us. And I have a meeting to go at, at 7, so right, I well, want to be rude hurry up, leave, but <laughs> i got plenty of time to make my meeting, second meeting of the day. Um, so it, we're in our 11th year, believe it or not. Um, the sign that is in the Mile Lawn Bridge Garden, there's a plaque. And we had a big weeding party there. We had 10 people helping us to weed um, and get ready to put mulch down in that big island. And someone said, how long has this garden been here? And I said, you know, let me go read the plaque, 2006. So I think that's a testimony to our commitment. 11 years is a long time to keep flowers going. We have bad winters, we have storms. Um, but the flowers keep coming back, so that's wonderful. And um, we we got back from Florida um, April 11th. Hit the drown, ground running. Started picking up stuff, moving sand around. So as the state employees, been really good about 
um, plowing the sand and shoveling and blowing and all that. Um, so that's where we are right now. We're still cleaning up and um, putting flowers in. I planted um, some spring flowers around the Lady by the Sea for Easter. So many people go there if it's a nice day, want to take pictures. So that was my first priority to get that looking good there. Um, more plants will be going in as the weather gets warmer. Still danger of frost, so you've got to kind of be careful um, what you put in. The trees all made out all right, except for the one on G Street. Have any idea what happened to that tree? Did it get hit by a truck? Or that's a bad storm, and if you storm. if it can't be fixed, I will donate a new tree. Okay. So if it can be trimmed yep. or fixed, fine. If not, I will personally donate a new. Okay. Tree. Yeah. I mean, it's flowering. The right. you know I've been watching it. Um, maybe if we just trim off, we'll go and trim off the broken branches okay. and see how it heals. <laughs> Chuck Street got hit by something. Bad storm. Okay. That's, wow. Um, I went to Churchill's to buy some supplies last weekend, and I ran into the Coast of Maine um, representative, and they put out a great um, compost product, and I had a conversation with him. Along in the short, I was buying six bags. He gave me six bags free. So I just wanted to put a shout out to Cameron Bonzi from um, Coast of Maine, and that was very, very generous of him. And he was there as a representative talking to people who use their product, and um, so that, that we got 50 bags of, you know, and, I mean, not 50 bags, we got 12 bags, and um, for half price, if you want to say it that way. So that was very, very generous. The soil needs to be amended here. We, we have a lot of soil, um, I mean, sand in the soil. So by adding compost, it helps to feed the plants. So I always add some compost. And anyway, so that, that was a, a windfall. Last year, we put in a lot of bulbs. Um, if you're coming over the bridge, it's a welcome to Hampton Beach sign. If you've noticed, there's probably about 20, maybe, yellow, um, yellow daffodils. It looks really, really nice. And I added a bunch of red tulips. Some are um, in the little garden at the bottom of the sidewalk here in the police uh, the fire station. The red tulips. We added red tulips behind the playground. That's been the new kind of addition. That was kind of Pete's idea. The parks employee who really wants to see some flowers and he's willing to help in any way he can and water and that. So we started adding some plants behind the playground and we actually had zinnias growing there last summer, which I just threw seeds in, and by um, the end of July we had zinnias, so that's that's pretty amazing from seed. So those are kind of the two new areas. Um, basically, we need more help, and one of our very good um, volunteers here, Terry, is kind of um, not up to snuff quite yet to be out working with us. So. None of us are getting any younger when, when, you know, when I think we've been doing this 11 years. Well, you know, I was in my 60s, and now I'm in my 70s. So um, we need, we just need more people to come and help us, whether, you know, if it's an hour a week, that's all you can give, man, you know, an hour to stand in water. John and I and, and a couple other men do the lion's share of putting down the mulch and the real heavy stuff. But during the summer, it's just mainly watering the flowers and maybe bending over some scissors and deadheading. So if anybody out there who's watching who kind of likes, we have a lot of new people who are living in the condominiums and they had gardens maybe and they don't garden now. So if you have any urge to get out and garden, um, please contact um, one of the beach commissioners or myself. And, um, and if you know nothing about the gardens, I, I'm more than happy to uh, to help people and ask Kathy, she really she was uh, garden impaired. I think she used to use the term. Yeah. So Linda, maybe so, you should get yeah, some flyers she, out and put in the put in the chamber, and we'll hit some of the yeah. uh, stores with them. Yeah. So we get can, some flyers you know, going. We try to be up, really conscious of people's uh, physical abilities and what they can and cannot do. But anything um, that you can help us with would be. Really, really. Because um. yeah, I think a lot of the summer residents don't watch 22, or they might yeah. not even know. Uh, but they're here in the summer. That right, probably and they're happy. willing to help. Yeah, and I mean, we've just started working, but the norm is 
people will make comments and they're they're all positive comments and I was behind the the playground putting some um, sweet alyssum in and a couple walked by and then the wife came over and she said I have to tell you my husband and wife walk by here and we see the flowers and it brings a smile to our face so you know that just just happened this week people do appreciate it it seems like a small thing but um, next time give it a adds it, huh? Next time, give them a watering. I know, I know, <laughs> and I, I told all the ten members of our committee, if someone stops and and asks questions and shows interest and strikes up a conversation, don't be shy about it. Exactly, say, well, you know, uh, we'd love to have you help water. Here's where it has, this is where we get the water from, and and all of that. So, um, we hope to to get some new people on board. So, <coughs> any questions about? Yes. Um, did you get the planter up in front of the aspirin? Tulis tried to lift it, and I'm, like you said, over I... the age of 25, and we couldn't lift it. In the urns? Yeah. So it got hit by a car or something? Really? I'm not sure what happened. I just saw I, I think it. It's, it's, I think it's back where it belongs. I don't know. Well, it's back now, yeah. Yeah, yeah. they seem, I, all three of them, I think, are back where yeah. they belong. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and they do get with the plows and everything yeah. to get marked around. That reminds me that state ha already has put the four urns <clears throat> on the stage. It's a bit early. I certainly hope nothing happens to them. When does entertainment start, Glenn? When would the... Uh, yes. Last Saturday. Okay. All right. It was All pouring right. rain, and there were people there we'll watching the show. Yeah. Okay. And it could be why they, they put them out. It's a little early... Um, we, again, we can still get frost, so I can put some cold weather plants in there, but I'm holding off on the petunias and the kind of I tender wait. things. I yeah. think you can wait. Okay. The mulch will help there. Yes. Yeah, for Fourth of July, you have them, right? I do. Have so, them, yeah. yeah. Okay. We used to put the flags. I think you had got them originally, Chuck. Mm -hmm. We put those in in the in the urns in early in the morning and take them down supper time. Um, don't leave them there overnight. Memorial Day weekend. Yeah, they have Memorial Day weekend. Okay. They have the service. Yeah, well, those the big Ashworth planters will get planted for Memorial Day, definitely. All right, great. So they'll look nice. Any other questions about gardens or flowers? Or? No, you're doing a great job. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Did you want one of these, Claire? <laughs> okay. Old business. <laughs> Mommy. No? I don't know. Is, is this what I'm about? Is the promenade old yes. or new? Old, I think. Uh, May 20th, 5 p.m., the junior class at Winnicott will be... Uh, having their grand march on the stage. And if you come by at 5 o'clock, you'll see all of the million-dollar dresses that I won. It looks like the Academy Awards. <laughs> dresses are unbelievable. And, um, and the fine taxes. Yeah. And we will be, uh, uh, once again, for our second year, um, uh, decorating the stage for them. And we also have a little bit of music for them. Um, we have a band coming in for them, as we did last year. So if you want to see the kids that want to cut it in the junior year, come down at 5 p.m. on May 20th. And I'd also like to take this opportunity to welcome Terry Smith back. Thrilled, I really am thrilled to see you looking so good. Welcome back. Welcome back. Bob, you have any old business? I had asked the Selectman Barnes to give us a little up-to-date on our attempts to get into the community rating system as a town. And yes, because I think a couple meetings ago, anyway, they had said that there was still some work that needed to be done between FEMA and the building inspector in relation to some sort of properties in the town. And I did speak with the building inspector, the town manager, and the assistant town manager. And there are still five properties that have very specific property issues that FEMA and the town still are working on to address these issues because they're not, for some reason, the town is not matched up with the current FEMA code. So that is still ongoing. The building inspector originally had 10 properties. He has been able to resolve five of the properties issues, but there's still five properties that, you know, it's still being worked on. So it might not be the immediate future, but hopefully it will be uh, 
sometime soon that we can resolve the issues with the town and Zeno. Anything else? All right, I'm going to thank the Rosnick family. Um, they were the owners of Ashley's. And, um, they've retired, and they've been great help with us selling the T-shirts for the, um, the the sand sculpture event. And they've just been super people, great, uh, great store, great business. It's sad that they're gone, they're gone, but I want to thank them and wish them well in the future. So I wanted to do that. And I was, and we just talked about the concerts. Uh, concerts have started. They'll be Saturdays now until Memorial Day. Then we have a bigger schedule coming in, right? So, so the next couple Saturdays. Every Saturday until Memorial Day weekend. Then it's Saturday and Sunday for the first week of June. When they drop the sand, we're in full program. Okay, great, excellent. Carol Shea Porter comes every time you have the reminiscence. All right. So, so we can get her a card, and then we can start on. Uh, she was there. Nice. She was there. Nice. She was there. Nice. All right. She had an umbrella. You couldn't see her under the umbrella. Wow, that's funny. All right. Excellent. Well, that's good to know. In case we have any issues, we can. Uh, we'll even give her a front row seat. I think. Exactly. <laughs> Reserved for no congresswoman. Yeah. So tell us she can sit. Excellent. Right. Mr. Loopley. Yeah, Excellent. Mr. Loopley. All right. Uh, new business. Bob. Uh, two things. One, I know we purchased the new slide. Do you have any sense of when it will be put in? No. Well, I'm working on trying to find someone. The new slide for the playground? A new slide for the playground. I'm working trying to find someone to install it. So if someone wants to come forward and help us. Um, the gentleman that's been doing a lot of the stuff, actually, actually not charging us doing the stuff, had a um, open heart surgery. So um, we have a beautiful new slide that we need to get installed. I noticed that uh, Wally's organized a group together to, to work on the Five Corners playground. So I am going to utilize uh, our connection with Wally's being a Hampton Beach business. Maybe we can get them to. Uh, Put another group together to help us get the slides. Right. And then we can put up who adopted the slide with a sign. Excellent. We could do that. And the, the other thing is, Eileen had mentioned something that probably is worth thinking about, and that would be connecting with the Winter Cutter High School in terms of exposing the kids to an opportunity to see some level of government act as a government to kind of give them an awareness in, in a sort of civic sort of way. Would you like to develop it a little or can you at this time? Yeah. I don't want to put you on the spot. Well, I think it's a little premature. If there's an interest, then um, certainly it would have to be for next year. Yeah. Um, but if there's an interest, then I think you can research it very readily at the high school with the department, see what their needs are, because um, it's conceivable it could be written into their course, their curriculum, their curriculum, correct. Or maybe it would just be an interest for them for a semester or whatever to come down. I don't know. <laughs> they all have government. So that'll probably it's a mandatory. Right it's a mandatory. It's uh, mandatory. Yeah. But how far you want to go with this opportunity would be kind of up to you people. Do we have enough to offer, or would they just be interested in coming, or you know maybe submitting a paper on it like your son did? With well, they have to go to a board meeting, mm -hmm. whether it's the village district, the selectmen's meeting, or a zoning meeting, and they have to see how government works. So maybe. You know, so and so I, that's why they jump at different meetings. I know uh, mo a lot of them, a lot of them end up at the selectmen's meeting, yeah, right? Meeting. Yeah, we had yeah. some uh, last month. Yeah. We just had a history teacher here. He just left. Yeah. Kevin that's right. Yeah. Right yeah. Oh, is that? Who that yeah. 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 That's Jake's brother. Yeah. yeah. Jake's oh. Brother. Yeah. But that is something that. Um, what? <laughs> what did you say? <laughs> Have some ideas what we can offer, and then pretend to 
there's a long way you can go with it, all the way just from the opportunity of coming here for one night, like your son and his friends did, um, or actually attending the meetings. They do at the high school. They have a, a representative at the uh, school board meeting, um, every meeting, and uh, it's written into the curriculum, and they agree to do it because they're graded on it, actually. So. Right. If, if no one had any objection, maybe we could reach out to the school in the fall and see if anything can be put together. In the right direction. Yeah. We thought you might be able to. I get a couple of friends. <laughs> well, I don't think we should wait till the fall because if they're doing their curriculum, they might need to do it before. Well, that's true, too. So we, maybe we should talk to them now. Okay. Excellent. I'll get the information for you. I have no new business. So we'll approve minutes from April 12, 2017. Do I have a motion to approve them as presented? Two sets there of minutes. What? I'll so move. Second. All in favor? So there's a lot of people here, so I'm wondering if we're going to have some public comment. Selectman Griffin. I've already heard most of what I have. <laughs> <laughs> Say it publicly, Rick. I'm just hoping that we do have the support of the Hampton Beach Area Commission, I mean, the Village District, Village District, because uh, it's very important. It's very important to me to tell people because, you know, people do pay their, oh, I thought that was going to fall. Um, people do pay their uh, tax all the way to Winnicunit Road. They're happy to be part of this group, and that's why they, they want to make sure that they're considered and given consideration. When you know, whenever is possible. Well, from what I remember, and I, maybe Bob can correct it, uh, is that the the scope of work was supposed to head forward to uh, to Winnicott, and I feel that the plan that's put forward is is great. I like a lot of what's there. I know some people around don't, <coughs> don't love everything on that plan. And I think that we have to, as a group, as the village district, as the selectmen in the town, and the Hampton Beach Area Commission have to come up with a way to either fund it or come up with a way to get them to concentrate to bring it forward. So I agree with you that we need to do something about it, but I don't want, I don't want to negatively impact the whole project. So we and need no to come up. No one's looking to negatively impact. I have 100 percent. I preferred if they just took what the experts said and did would have been perfect with me. Right. But I support 100 percent of what's come forward already. I just don't support being left out of it totally, especially when I've worked on it for so many years. No, Everybody agree. here there knows who I am, uh, and they're all so nice. All of the people that work for DOT and people like Bill Watson, we all work with them. We know right. what a great guy he is. So I just hope that we continue to have everybody's support. So I, I'm sure there's, that you have my support. I, I'm, I, Absolutely. I, yeah. I think as, as sure. a village district, you have our, our support, uh, and there's got to be a way to fund it or find a way to fund it or or re route some of the money to, to include it. So I, I think we'll go forward that way and talk talk okay, about it at our next commission Thank meeting. Thank you, Rick. Anybody else have a public comment? It's a traffic study. Yes. Hi, um, Kathy Silver, the director of the Blue Ocean Discovery Center. Um, we're coming up. On our busy season, it's just right on the horizon. June 3rd is the first Saturday in June, and we're having a big race. This is our 5K road, I was going to say road race, our 5K beach race. Okay, it's half on the road and half on the sand, and it starts at 9 o'clock. Uh, we need volunteers. We need people to stand out there and tell our runners basically where the path is, where they should be going, to cheer them on, just that sort of thing. Right? We also, we, we already have over 100 people registered, but if there's anybody out there who wants to run or walk, we'd love to have you register. You just go on to blueoceansociety.org. We have a lot of prizes this year, a lot of categories. In addition to, of course, the winner of the race, we also have uh, uh, prizes for the best costume, and because we want to see people dressed up. And for the person who collects the most trash along the way. 
So clearly they're not going to be the fastest because they're going to have to stop and pick up the trash. But we will, we have gift certificates and all kinds of things for the most trash. And then at 1030, we have a big, big beach cleanup planned. So, so it's a, you know, it's an all morning affair. So if this is anything that you'd like to participate in or volunteer at, we could certainly use you. Then the next thing is, um, Saturday the 24th, we are hosting the Aquarian Water Company's Environmental Awareness Awards. And that'll be on the stage and then in the Discovery Center as well. So that's a bit of a big deal. So those are our two big events. We'll be opening for the season on the 17th. And it, we, we go right with the sandcastles because we, we know, okay, that's the big draw there. When the sandcastles and school gets out, that's when we get busy as well. And I, would, I mentioned last month how grateful we are for the support of the Village District. Well, now I have a certificate of appreciation. Okay. okay. Thank you. And this is to the Hampton Beach Village District by the Blue Ocean Society for Marine Conservation for your commitment to a th thriving marine environment through your support of our research, education, and conservation programs. We very much appreciate the support of the Village District. I think some people don't realize that we pay rent, and we pay a lot of rent to the state. I can't tell you the exact amount right now because we're negotiating it, but in addition to rent, we also pay commission on everything we sell, and we pay um, a percentage of the gate, so to speak, how many people come through. So we have quite a big overhead. and. We, um, while most of the people in the building are either interns or volunteers, we do always have at least one paid employee there at a time. Okay? And like so many of the other volunteers and interns, I don't get paid. So yeah, it's a labor of love for many of us. And so here we go. Great. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you. It'll be on the wall. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I was going to do that and close the comments. Tuesday at 5, right? Yeah, it's supposed to be. There was some talk that it might change, but... I don't think they will at this point, so it's kind of late. At the pavilion, right? The pavilion. So the state of New Hampshire at 5 o'clock on Tuesday is having a um, basically an open house to talk about what's good and what's bad, of what's going on at the state parks. Tuesday is the 16th, and it's at the, in the pavilion. And, all right, so that's something that everybody should attend if they can. It's great. Okay, any other public comments? We're all set with that. Closing comments, Bob? No, I don't have any. I'm good. All right, and I already said what I was going to say, so on that note, I'm going to close this meeting at 7.07. Thank you, everyone.